Good morning. It is great to be here with you this morning to worship with you saints here in Leavenworth. Uh, my name is Jonathan Anderson. I am a member at Cornerstone Reformed Church in Carbondale, sister church in our presbytery. I'm a deacon in training there as well as I am licensed in Tyndale Presbytery to preach as I am um, waiting for a call or if I pursue a call into pastoral ministry. Uh, it was pretty exciting coming to Leavenworth. I've really only heard of Leavenworth from the prison. That's all I knew. But driving through, I was able to see a sign saying First City in Kansas. I wasn't aware of that. That was pretty neat. As well as seeing a sign that there's a sister city in Wagga Wagga, Australia. As well as knowing this is now the uh, hometown of Melissa Etheridge. And then I also found it unique and something that will not leave my memory soon, I saw a Sonic with a massive playground and it looked like a sand volleyball court. Never would have imagined seeing that in my entire life, but that's what happens when you travel to churches and you preach. You get to see and experience new things. I was also able to come with my son, Luke, who's turning nine this week to be able to have a father-son birthday trip. So uh, let us now come and we will read our gospel lesson, which is our sermon text this morning. It's from the gospel according to St. Luke Chapter 6, beginning in verse 36. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. Let's pray. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Jesus, our rock and our near kinsman. Today's gospel lesson in our sermon text includes what's arguably the most misquoted, abused, and weaponized verses in the entire Bible. Judge not, lest you be judged. You hear it out of the mouth of everyone confronted with their sin, it's become the slogan of our culture. Whether it's in the phrase, only God can judge me, made famous in the hip hop, uh, hip hop and rap scene, or if you listen to heavy metal, the song Holier Than Thou on Metallica's Black Album references this. It's used to justify any and all lifestyles and behaviors and used as a weapon to turn any confrontation back to the person leveling the charges. Now, we can't avoid making judgments. We make them each and every day when we choose one action over another, when we fulfill our duties and responsibilities instead of pursuing sloth and wickedness. We make judgments. We discriminate. We order our loves and our lives according to a standard. All people do this. No one is exempt, which is why this verse is so abused. People speak and act as if they can transcend this reality. And now, we as Christians, we need to be very careful because when we see so many people hurling this verse at us wrongly, we can build walls and defenses that lead us into falling into the ditch on the other extreme, where we become so concerned about truth and making correct judgments that we nitpick everyone on everything they say, and we do it under the guise of discernment or truth. And this has just increased with social media, YouTube, and podcast, and especially is a temptation in our reform world where we so value truth, goodness, and beauty. Well, one of my favorite bands, Me Without You, and one of their songs called Bullet to Binary 2, have sought to kind of reverse this by asking a question about why haven't we taken Jesus' command to forgive in this passage and run wild with it. And so this is what they say. 
We all well know we're going to reap what we sow. But grace, we all know, can take the place of what we owe. So why not? Let's forgive everyone, everywhere, everything, all the time, everyone, everywhere, everything. So now you can be the judge if, and that's a pun intended, whether they have in the right with trying to take this passage and run with it as far as they have with what Jesus said. And so our current cultural moment and the abuses and misuses aside, we can't ignore or pass over our gospel reading, our sermon text this morning. We must let it challenge us. We need to hear it anew this morning and let the weight of Jesus's words sit with us. Jesus is telling us how his people are to live. He's giving directions on the way in which we are to live. He is prescribing the behaviors, actions, and attitudes of his people. And this is what the renewed Israel gathered around him will look like, will act like. And we can't simply try to explain away the hard sayings of Jesus because they make us uncomfortable. We must let his word confront us and change us. And so this morning in our text, we will first look at Jesus's commands, and then second, we will go and we'll discuss his parable. And then lastly, we will apply these things as, uh, to us as the church of God. So first, it, it's interesting the way that I have broken up this passage of Scripture. And one of the reasons why is because I'm following some of the lectionary texts for today. Um, and so... If you're not familiar with the lectionary is, the lectionary is used within the church to um, assign the appropriate readings for that given Sunday. And so you have what's called, most common one, it's called the Revised Common Lectionary. That's the one most churches use. Uh, my readings here come from a few weeks back on the one-year lectionary, the historic one-year lectionary, which is what the church used for centuries prior to this revision that came about. And I find it interesting that our forebears decided to break this passage up in the way that they did. I mean, if you all um, have a Bible, you could see that there, were, there was a section heading that separated these verses. You know, section headings aren't there. And so if we read through the Bible without those, we can see that Jesus's words kind of go together. And that's what they were trying to emphasize, that this passage, this uh, conclusion of the section on Jesus's teaching of loving your enemies, be merciful even as your heavenly father is merciful, is connected with this next se uh, section on judgment. They wanted to emphasize this connection that, Ma uh, that Luke makes in distinction from Matthew's gospel, because Matthew has this same phrase, but it's not be merciful, it's be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. That's in the Sermon on the Mount. And so what we have here is this is the hinge, this character of uh, God, his mercy, is the hinge between uh, loving our enemy and not judging. That goes into the next thing. It's the character of the Father that we are to imitate. And God's people are to love their enemies, and God's people are to bear with their brothers mercifully. This is a hinge which takes us into this next section. And so so let's consider Jesus's commands in verses 37 and 38. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put in your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, Jesus issues four commands. So two are negative, do not judge, and do not condemn. And two are positive, forgive and give. These commands are in the present tense, emphasizing this should be the habitual behavior of his people and that these are actions you must stop or start doing now. The two negative commands, do not judge and do not condemn, are related not just because they're negative commands, don't do them. Judgment and condemnation are related to sight and what is seen. Judgment doesn't necessarily result in a negative outcome. You could be tried in a court of law and judged to be innocent and vindicated. Judgment is about evaluation based upon evidence. Now, condemnation is rendering a judgment of guilty and declaring punishment as required. 
Jesus linking judgment and condemnation in the negative is addressing a specific way judgment and condemnation are being carried out that he's trying to address with the audience. And that is what he's saying needs to stop. And now, forgiving and giving aren't based upon sight, these two positive commands. You have to believe the words that someone says and the actions they do to know if someone is sincere. So if somebody asks for forgiveness, you kind of have to believe that they're genuine and sincerely wanting this and that their actions correspond to this statement that they say because we can't really be for certain. And Jesus said, you're to forgive a brother 70 times. So as they come and ask for forgiveness, you ask for, uh, you grant it to them. Now giving is the same. You don't know if the need that is being brought to you is a legitimate need or if the gift will be used wisely or poorly. Jesus says, give to everyone who begs you. And that's just something he has said in a few verses earlier. Uh, Jesus says to give to them. Forgiveness and giving are acts done by faith, not sight. Jesus is outlining the truth Paul reminds us of that we walk by faith and not by sight. And now, additionally, each command is also divided into two parts, one active and one passive, meaning do not judge and you will not be judged. So the active one is do not do this. The passive is and you will not be judged. That is something that will happen to us. So that raises the question, who is the one that will not judge us, who will not condemn us, who will forgive us and will finally give to us? And it should be clear that it's the Father, the one we are to imitate. It means that our actions and obedience to these commands have eternal consequences. Now, it shouldn't be surprising considering the Lord's Prayer. So forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And Jesus elaborated on this in the Sermon on the Mount. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Or consider Romans 8. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So judgment and condemnation are in the hands of God. We do not need to fear them, but we need to understand that it is through God that we will receive judgment. We will, receive, uh, we will be free from condemnation. We will receive forgiveness, and we will be given what we need. Now, it's striking here that Jesus doesn't add any qualifications or explanations as he issues these commands, except for the one about giving. His illustration, though, is kind of strange as well. It most likely refers to a common marketplace experience. If you have a basket or a bushel, and you're filling it with something, with fruits or vegetables or grain, you're going to kind of shake it around, you jostle it so that things fall, they get more space in there so you can add more in. I'm some of you probably have done that before where you try to move it around so you can get as much as possible in there, especially if they're doing it not by weight, by what you can fit in a container. Um, and then you have this idea uh, also that um, for the grain being pressed down, so um, you have a container and someone's just pressing down on it to give you more space so that you're getting as much as possible in there. And the idea is that you're coming away completely filled. Now, the last phrase about being put in the lap seems to be referencing how the folds in a person's garment could be brought up to be able to hold an overabundance of things. So kind of that is what it means to be put in the lap. And so I'm reminded in that sense of the story of Ruth and the exchange between Boaz and Ruth on the threshing floor. Ruth has given up everything to come under the wings of Yahweh and to care for her mother-in-law, Naomi. She's given up her entire life for her. And Boaz sees and recognizes this. He judges her to be a good and godly woman who could have gotten remarried and had a good life. And Boaz tells her to bring the garments she has worn and hold them out so that he can fill them with grain and puts it on her, the text says. Another way of saying, put in the lap. And so she receives abundantly from Boaz. 
She gave, and it was given back to her in abundance. And obviously, this is a picture of Christ and his church. So Jesus concludes his commands with the lesson that we're to learn in this. And the standard with which you measure others will be the same standard the Lord will use on you. And so that means we must be careful. Will you be able to stand when your standard is measured out to you by the Lord? And that's what Jesus wants us to get from these commands. And so then next, Jesus switches and shifts it to give a parable. And so we'll review this parable in two sections. So in verses 39 and 40, can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Now, this has always seemed to me like it comes from left field. Why does Jesus now talk about leading and teaching? Disciples and teachers. How does this connect to these commandments that just have come before it? And so if we understand that Jesus' teaching ministry is a challenge to the current leadership of Israel, then we can make connections. These commands he's just issued are the opposite behaviors of the Jewish leaders. They are blind. Sight and judgment go together. They can't make proper judgments. They can't even see the kingdom of God has come before them in the ministry of Jesus. Now they're making false judgments, declaring who is and who is not a faithful Jew. And this is done by their sight. And this is seen dramatically in the next chapter of Luke, where a Pharisee has Jesus into his house, but condemns Jesus' actions in receiving the sinful woman. Now, Jesus confronted him, and he gives him a story about a moneylender and his two debtors, and how the moneylender forgives both of them. One of them had a greater debt than the other, and so Jesus asked them, which of the two who were in debt is going to love the money lender more. And the Pharisee rightly states, the one who had the larger debt. And Jesus interestingly says that you have judged rightly. But when the rubber met the road, when this same situation was right in front of the very eyes of this Pharisee, he is condemning the very son of God for receiving a woman who was a sinful woman but this sinful woman who had received forgiveness, an abundance of forgiveness at the feet of Jesus. He can't see her act as an overflow of the love she has for the great forgiveness she has received. And we also know that the scribes and Pharisees put unnecessary burdens on the people, which they couldn't even carry or bear themselves. They bound up people with burdens. They didn't set them free or loose them from their bonds, which is just another way of saying they didn't extend forgiveness, because that's what forgiveness really means, is loosing those bonds, getting rid of those burdens that are upon you, the weight that has been put upon you that will bring about judgment. So consider Jesus' healings on the Sabbath. The Pharisees are more concerned with these people obeying their understanding of the Sabbath, that they are binding upon them in their current sin-wracked state, instead of doing good and truly extending rest that Jesus is doing. They aren't seeing the actual forgiveness and freedom that Jesus is giving when he heals on the Sabbath and brings about its true fulfillment. They're blind guides. And Jesus is saying, if you follow them, you will be blind as well. And this is what Jesus means here about a disciple, not able to be greater than his teacher. If you follow the Jewish leaders, you aren't going to get beyond them and be the type of disciple that Jesus is calling you to be. The errors of your leaders will not be able to be overcome. And this just demonstrates once again that the disciples are to imitate their father. And it's a call for us to make sure that we are not putting ourselves underneath teachers that could lead us astray. It's also, you know, it can be a very uh, temptation sometimes even in the reform world when we value things like apologetics and stuff uh, about defending the faith where we want to read certain things to where we get engulfed in them and we can start following them and we can say, okay, I want to know everything about this. 
where that's now become our sole diet of error, that it is now impacting our ability to see truth. That is the same idea here that Jesus is saying. And so we are to imitate the Father. We are to not only do that, but we're to imitate the Son. He is our great teacher who only does what he sees his Father doing. And so he loves his enemies. He prays for them. He forgives them. He heals and he sets free. He bears with his disciples, though they're slow of heart to believe. And he gives his life for the sake of the world. He gives his life for his disciples. And he is judged by his father and he's vindicated by his father. And he's raised up and set free from the bonds of death. And he's glorified and given a name above all names. And so if you want to obey his commands, you must walk in his footsteps. You must be like him as he imitates his father. Now, Jesus next goes on in verses 41 and 42. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye, when you yourselves do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that's in your brother's eye. And this is where we begin to see what we're meant to understand the previous commands that Jesus gave. We're not to be like the blind guides, the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders. We aren't to be hypocrites. That's what Jesus is driving home. We aren't to be searching for the issues in the lives of others while ignoring our very own real problems. His use of brother emphasizes that this is about the new community and the life together that Jesus is setting up. So the relationship between brothers is to be one of mercy and patience to create peace. Now, it doesn't mean that there is never any rebuke or correction. Notice that the brother does have a speck in his eye. And it's noticeable. He has something that's getting in the way of him being able to see clearly and accurately. It's getting in the way of his own judgment. But it's imperative that we have addressed our own issues in our own lives and not hypocritically pass judgment on our fellow brothers. So this is the call for the new Israel to not mirror the old Israel, to not follow their leaders, and to not imitate them, but rather to imitate the Father in heaven and his Son, their Lord and teacher. So it is a restorative justice that seeks the actual good of your brother, not a way of which to use their sins as a leverage to make yourself look better and to think that you have a better standing with God than them because you have arrived or you are further along with them, using their own weakness as a way to make yourself seem strong. And so now let's consider some applications. And I mean, this passage, we could talk about so many various things, uh, but I just want to bring out three things um, and kind of address these topics. Um, So the first we see is that there is actually a unique focus here and these commands related to those who are in authority. So they're primarily about leaders, rulers, elders, pastors and teachers, husbands, fathers and mothers, employers, all of those who have authority over someone else. And so that is one of the things that fascinates me the most about Uh, the combining of these texts in the lectionary. So why include the narrative about Joseph and his brothers in Genesis 50 on a text about judgment and uh, a parable about a speck in your own eye? I don't think it's simply because it's about forgiveness. Joseph is not just some guy. It's not just some story about some private brother disagreements. Joseph is is the second most powerful person in the known world. He is the right-hand man to Pharaoh. So his brothers aren't simply approaching him as a brother, but as the very one who could lawfully issue their own death sentence. 
And so this uh, fascinates me, and it's very interesting in two ways. One, uh, we see Joseph, by their coming to him and their request, is actually so saddened by their response and their plan that he weeps. Have you, we, we're familiar with this passage, uh, you know, what God intended for evil I brought, brings about for good. But have we ever thought that when this is actually brought to Joseph by his brothers, that his first response is weeping, that they would try to make sure that he doesn't want to kill them? He weeps over this, almost as if, do you not know the God to whom I serve? Why would you think I would act in my own vengeance to take vengeance on myself for the way that you treated me? Do you not know that I trusted God in all of this, even though I was wronged? And if there is something that God is going to judge, it will be left up to him. Why would you think that I would do this to my own brothers? Why would you think I would exact vengeance on my own self, uh, in my own name upon you? Do you not know I can leave it up to God? And so that struck me. And um, they failed to realize that their sin ultimately is not to Joseph. It's against God himself. And he recognizes this by letting them know that in his own position of authority, he could do this. But he leaves the judgment up to God because he doesn't want this to be seen as him acting on vengeance, of taking it out for his own sake. And that they will, if their behavior does deserve it and they are truly not repentant, will be judged on the last day. And second, it reminds us that the commands of Jesus aren't just about your private life and relationships. They're not just something that is private matters between you and your friends or things like that. The commands of Jesus apply to every area of your life, including public office. Jesus is giving these commands to his disciples. But these disciples are primarily the apostles the ones who will be sent out with his authority, the rulers of the new Israel who will sit on 12, tro- uh, 12 thrones and judge the 12 tribes in the new age, in the regeneration, as it says in Matthew. These commands are just as applicable to rulers and those in authority. You don't get a free pass on obeying these commands and being the type of person shaped by them because you bear the sword or you have a position of authority. It once, it once again means looking to and imitating the Father and His Son. It, it reminds us that those who are in authority, that those who have the sword or those who have the power of the rod, we don't discipline because we're angry. We don't discipline because we're seeking revenge. We don't, the wrath of God does not produce the righteousness. Uh, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. It means that our discipline, our actions, all of those actions, things are to be done for the sake of bringing about good order and good for those who are under our care. Just like in our own body, you know, Jesus says, if your uh, hand, if your right hand uh, or left hand sins against you, cut it off and cast it away. It's not because you hate this part of the body, it's because you care about something more. You care about fuller health, fuller good. Just like with a body politic, you don't just simply cut off people because you're mad and angry. You do it for the good of the whole body. You have to understand the way in which you exercise your authority. And even in the home, you don't just discipline your children because they made you mad, because they upset something or the order of things that you had going. It's because you want to have a ordered home that brings glory to God. Discipline is for the ends of doing that. And we can, because of our current cultural moment, be very tempted as those who have authority and those who want to see the rule of Christ not only um, come into our own lives and come into our churches, but see governments submit to the Lord Jesus Christ because Christ is Lord. We can have a tendency to want to see all of our enemies just be abused because we're mad and we don't like what's going on instead of recognizing and seeing that what we want is actually good order. We want to see people worshiping Christ and those who do not submit to him will be judged by him and will, if they are cut off, cut off for the sake of their good, hopefully for their repentance, their conversion, but if not, their ultimate judgment and destruction. And so it reminds us that we do not have and do not seek our own vengeance. 
we leave it to the wrath of God. And I'm reminded of the very song that David sings after Saul and Jonathan are killed. He laments the death of Saul and Jonathan. There's a song about the very one who pursued him and tried to kill him. David has a song for him where he laments him. And it's inscripturated and it's in our, it's in our Bibles as a way of reminding us that David was not seeking his own vengeance. Even as a ruler, he did not seek his own. It was for the glory of God. And it is a lesson for all those who rule of how we are to rule in love and charity and for seeking the good of those under our care. Even if that means we have to make hard decisions, hard judgments, and that are condemnations. That is what we must see and what we understand from this text. Second, this also lets us know, don't be a meme. Don't be that well actually guy. If any of you know or are familiar with that meme, the hypercritical person that believes their opinion on every matter is warranted and wanted by all. They go out of their way to let you know what they think about something, even if you didn't ask them. They're the person that you cringe inwardly when you see them walk up to a group of conversa- uh, and a conversation you're having with your friends because you know all they will say is something critical or point out where you're wrong or how they know everything. So don't be that person. Don't be that person who is always so intent on judging, nitpicking, and correcting everyone especially on opinions that really don't matter. They're just opinions. There are certain things that you need to hold loosely. You don't make them points of contention or disunity. There are, there are, are things that you can just let go. You may have an opinion about homeschooling versus Christian schooling. That's fine. We can have these different opinions, but they don't get in the way of our unity in Christ. They're opinions. We hold these things loosely. And at the end of the day, the, this type of person, this one who is judgmental, hypercritical and nitpicking of others is failing to heed what Paul lays out in Romans 14 about not passing judgment on fellow Christians on matters indifferent. He says, who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls. So don't be that type of Christian. Don't be the well actually guy. And third, it means uh, in our own personal relationships, in our interpersonal relationships with one another, that we're not setting unreasonably high standards for others, which we don't apply to ourselves. And this can be a tendency where we expect so much of others, but yet we let ourselves pass if it were in a similar, if we were in that same situation. So it means husbands, as you are, are, are you holding out unreasonable expectations on your wives in keeping the home? in the day in, day out rearing and schooling of children and expectations you have on them while you are at work? Are you considering her as the weaker vessel or is it that you're only thinking about what you could handle and so judge her by your standards of what you think you could bear? And fathers, have you expected so much from your children that you know you would have been crushed under that same weight of expectation as a child? A lot of us are first-generation reform people. We weren't raised in this type of culture. And so we are experiencing things that are new. And we are thinking and coming to truths that we don't, we weren't raised with. And so we want to make sure our kids are not like us, that they get the best Christian education. They are instructed in all of these things and that they know this and that and they're well ordered that we forget that they're still children. And so as fathers, we need to make sure that we are not exasperating them by, uh, by keeping and holding out lofty goals while failing to recognize their own age and levels of maturity. We're not excusing sin as if sin's okay, but we patiently bear with it, just like Jesus did with his disciples. They were slow of heart to believe, but he didn't cast them away. Just like our children, they are growing, they are young, and they are maturing into their faith. And we need to not 
exasperate them. So fathers, make sure your standards are scripture standards. Now it means wives, are you constantly seeing the flaws in your husband and constantly telling him ways that he could improve? Are you constantly discontent about your home, your own children, your station in life to the point that it's nothing but the sound of dripping water that drives everyone away? Mothers, are you setting the tone in your home based upon your own feelings, the ways in which you relate and see your children compared to other women's children? Is this the way that you are evaluating and holding the standard of what you want your children to be based upon how you feel they are compared to others? Mothers, especially of young men and boys, that's uh, not everybody, but it's one that applies to me because I have five young sons and then uh, one daughter. Are you holding your young sons, are you holding young men to the same way you would treat your daughters? And so then exasperating them because they are not women. They are men. They will relate to you differently. Their, uh, their ability to open up to you is not because they don't want to open up. It's because they're young men. They are different than girls. And so don't hold this out and make it seem as if it is something wrong with them instead of recognizing and dealing with them as sons. Don't let that be a way of nagging and correcting them to the point that they feel as if they are simply failures for being young men. It means children, you children out there, not thinking that you're always so mistreated by holding out some impossible standard to your parents that they must meet because if they really loved you, they'd let you do what this person does. Why do you, why do you not let me do this? They get to do this. Well, that's a standard that you can't hold your parents to. They're your parents. They're not their parents. Or why do you let my older sibling do something that I can't do? Well, it's because they're older than you and they have been given more responsibility. Don't think that it's simply not fair. It's easy to see all the sins in your siblings or in your parents and fail to see that you also have many of those same sins as well, especially when it seems like you're the one who's always getting in trouble. Beware of this thinking that you are the only one that gets in trouble. You are dealt with uniquely by your parents because you are unique. And so trust them. And as you're getting older, those who are getting to be teenagers, as you're coming to own your faith more, you need to be careful that you don't fall into the trap of holding people who have greater weight and responsibility to the same standards that you have in your walking with Christ when you have a relatively light load. You have a lot of freedom to read the scriptures, to read books, to do things like this. And it can be a temptation to think, I wish everybody else was as sold out for Jesus as me. Failing to realize that they have a lot of responsibilities upon their shoulders. So be careful. That can be a great temptation in your younger years. It means singles not, uh, not letting that station in life that God has called you to at this time to make you discontent. You must be content. If you do desire to marry, you need to make sure you haven't set the bar too high. It means accurately measuring yourself so that you aren't blind and seeing many options before you or ways in which you can improve yourself so that you can be one who is desirable to others. It also means that singleness, if you choose it, which is an option, it can't be a means to allow yourself to be discontent in the church when you have people who are married and have kids. You can't be now upset that your relative freedom in comparison to their responsibilities allows you to serve in more capacities or be asked to serve in ways. Take that as a call to action and let that be a way in which you can serve the body of Christ in that station. And all of this ultimately comes back to the verse of our gospel lesson, what we heard first. Be merciful as your father is merciful. We're called to show mercy, 
And this should be what we are known for as Christians and as the church of God. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. We do this so that we can live at peace with God and with one another. We're to eagerly pursue the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. We're to seek the peace of Jerusalem. We actually even sang that hymn about seeking the peace of Salem. We're called if possible, so far as it depends on us to live peaceably with all. And we should pray for our leaders and rulers so that we can lead quiet and peaceful lives. We will have peace as we extend mercy and patiently bear with one another. And therefore, we're to be merciful as our Heavenly Father is merciful. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit by their teaching that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. And now let's pray what our Lord taught us to pray.